Well, good afternoon, brethren. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Hope everyone's had a great week. It is wonderful and such a blessing to have a Sabbath at the end of every week. It's been that way from the very beginning, and it's, it truly is a blessing. As always, I'd like to start out with a shout-out to very, three very uh, wonderful ladies, uh, to Nancy Miller, to Daisy Swinton, to Jean Ward. Also, a uh, uh, happy Sabbath to all of our brethren in Australia, and a special one to Bruce Metzger and to Teresa and John down in Monterey. Again, I hope everyone's having a wonderful Sabbath. Brethren, many of you own or have owned fruit trees. Fruit trees can be a great blessing and can provide fruit for eating, for canning, and for giving as gifts. I have very fond memories of the fig tree that was in the backyard of my parents' house when I was a preschooler back in the 1960s. And I remember mom picking the figs, and I remember mom making her delicious fig preserves every year. I have great memories of that, and to this day, fig preserves are still one of my favorites. There are two basic types of fruit trees, those that bear fruit and those that don't. In his publication entitled, Why Fruit Trees Fail to Bear, Dr. Shingru Yao, an assistant professor at New Mexico State University, writes, Fruit trees normally begin to bear fruit when they are old enough to flower. Nevertheless, the health of the tree, its environment, its fruiting habits, and the cultural practices you use all influence its ability to produce fruit. Adequate pollination is essential to fruit yield. One unfavorable condition can, yield, can reduce yield or prevent the tree from bearing any fruit. Most fruit trees are propagated by grafting or budding the selected variety onto a rootstock. The age from planting when trees can be expected to bear fruit depends on the type of fruit you're growing. Apple, apricot, and sour cherry trees require three to five years. Peach trees two to four years. Pear and plums four to six and quince and sweet cherry trees, five to seven. So according to Dr. Yao, most fruit trees do not bear fruit for three to seven years after they've been planted. What's interesting about this time period between planting and bearing the first fruit, the grower or the farmer does not know whether the tree will bear much fruit or not, whether the tree will bear any fruit, and whether the fruit that the tree bears will be good or bad. The grower or the farmer has to wait until the tree bear, begins to bear fruit to determine the condition and the yield of the fruit from the tree. You know, the same is true in our spiritual lives. God the Father plants His Holy Spirit in us at our baptism, and then He patiently waits years and years and years after our baptism as we grow spiritually, as we mature spiritually, and as we begin to bear fruit. But just like the physical trees, what is not known is the quantity and the quality of the fruit that we will bear. Bearing good, abundant fruit is a hallmark of a Christian and of someone being led by God's Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but bearing good, abundant fruit takes work. It takes dedication. It takes perseverance. It takes patience and it takes time. In my sermon this afternoon entitled, Are We Bearing Good Abundant Fruit? In preparation for the upcoming Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, I'd like to explore the subject of where we are in our journey toward God's kingdom, where we are in overcoming our sins, and where we are in producing the spiritual good abundant fruit that God the Father expects and desires in us and from us. Please turn with me to Galatians 5. To begin with, let's read a very familiar and famous section of Scripture dealing with the fruit of the Spirit that reflects God the Father and Jesus Christ working in and through us by His Holy Spirit. 
We read this in Galatians 5, and we'll read verses 22 and 23. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now in the New Living Translation, it says, it translates these characteristics in the following way. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So brethren, in today's sermon, I'd like to discuss four questions to consider in helping us to determine what kind of fruit that we are bearing, which is a very important gauge and indicator as to where we are in our journey toward the kingdom of God. The first question to ask ourselves in determining what kind of fruit we are bearing is, are we redeeming the time? Are we redeeming the time? Please turn with me to Ephesians 5. The Apostle Paul exhorts us to do just that. It's a very important concept. Are we redeeming the time? Ephesians 5, and we'll begin in verse 14. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14. Paul writes, Wherewith he said, Awake you that sleep and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, you be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. I think we all agree that the days that we're living in right now are very evil. The Greek word for to redeem in, ch in verse 16, is exagorazo, E-X-A-G-O-R-A-Z-O. It's Strong's number 1805, which means to buy up or to rescue from loss. So redeeming the time is to rescue the time from loss. The time that we have remaining in our lives from loss. So brethren, do we live our lives as if our lives have no end? We have this eternal complex that all young people have. Do we live our lives as if we have plenty of time and plenty of opportunities and to, to grow and to develop next week, next month, next year, sometime in the, in the future? Are we redeeming the time that we have left in our physical lives on this earth? Are we making progress? Do we prioritize getting our spiritual house in order? Or do we just keep procrastinating, thinking to ourselves that there is always tomorrow? There will be a time when there will not be a tomorrow. God the Father and Jesus Christ are very patient with us. However, there is an expectation and there is a requirement for us to bear fruit. Please turn with me to Luke 11. There is a time limit for us to bear fruit. Christ discussed this and the existence of this time limit in a parable to the multitudes. We read this parable in 11, Luke 11 and verse 6. Luke chapter 11 and verse 6. And Christ spoke also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why does it cumber the ground? And he, ans and he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I, till I shall dig about it, and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that you shall cut it down. Now, brethren, in this parable, that time limit was three years with a one-year extension for that tree. 
But the tree was to be cut down if it didn't bear fruit after that one-year extension. There was a time limit after which the tree would be removed. No more time, no more excuses, no more chances. In this parable, God the Father is the owner, owner of the vineyard. And Jesus Christ is the dresser of the vineyard. The unfruitful fig tree represents one of the people whom God the Father has called out of this world. Who knows the truth, but who has not produced the spiritual fruit that our Heavenly Father requires. The time limit that God has given for us to bear fruit is unknown. None of us know. God gives us the opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to grow and to mature and to, to bear good fruit. But are we putting off those opportunities? Are we taking God's requirement to bear good, abundant fruit seriously? Please turn with me to Luke 12. Luke chapter 12. Christ gave another parable about a wealthy man who thought he had so much time left in his life he thought he had it made and he planned for the future yet in reality he did not and we read this in Luke 12 beginning in verse 16 Luke chapter 12 and verse 16 and Christ spoke a parable unto them saying the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build better and greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have, many, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, eat drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, You fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. He was going to die that night, and he didn't know it. Then who, sa who shall those things be which you have provided? So is he that lays treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Do we live our lives that way? Brother, none of us know how much longer any of us have in our physical lives. We may somehow think that we're going to live another 20, 30, or 40 years. Many of us know we don't have that long. Are we making the most of the time that we have left to draw closer to our Heavenly Father and to do His will and to bear the fruit that He desires us to bear? Are we redeeming the time and rescuing from loss the time that we have left? Please turn with me to Revelation 3, where we'll read about a church that did not redeem the time that they had. Christ had John write and warn the church at Laodicea that judgment upon them was coming. And we read this in Revelation 3. We've read this in so, so many sermons before, but it is a warning to all of us. Revelation 3, beginning in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were either cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Total rejection. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods, and I have need of nothing. And no, know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, just like the rich man storing his goods. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich, and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You now, brethren, the latest sins were part of the called-out ones of our Heavenly Father. They were part of the faith. 
However, they just did not see and did not fathom the importance of the immediacy of overcoming their sins and bearing good fruit. They became lax and comfortable. They became proud and arrogant. They grew to feel that they didn't have need of anything. And maybe they, they really didn't need God all that much because they were so well off. And in the end, God rejected them for a certain period of time. Brother and I have said many times before in sermons that the church is not a country club. We cannot afford to become too lax and too comfortable. Brethren, is there an urgency in our spiritual lives? Are we drawing closer and closer to God the Father and Jesus Christ with each passing day? Or do we find that we put God the Father, so to speak, on the shelf and bring Him out when it's convenient? Brethren, are we redeeming the time? The second question to ask ourselves in determining what kind of fruit we are bearing is, are we overcoming our sins and weaknesses? Are we overcoming our sins and weaknesses? Brethren, where are we in overcoming our sins? Are we still trying to overcome sins that we've been fighting for maybe even years, maybe even decades, but without total success? Do we continue to do the things that we know do not please God the Father, but because of weakness we continue to commit those sins? Please turn with me to Romans 7. You know, the Apostle Paul discusses this inner struggle, which is true, truly a dichotomy in the life of a Christian. We read this in Romans 7, beginning in verse 14. I'll read this out of the New Living Translation. Romans 7 and verse 14. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. If I know what, that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong, it is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle in life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life? that is dominated by sin and death. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Brother, do these verses describe us in our spiritual lives? It, it describes everyone. It is our daily struggle. The Apostle Paul was writing about the daily struggle that every Christian deals with in their spiritual lives. The good that we want to do, we don't do it. And the evil that we hate, that we know we shouldn't do, that's what we do. Paul is talking about two types of sin here in Romans 7. The first type of sin mentioned in verses 15 and 19 is the sin of omission. It is the good that we want to do, but then we don't do it. We know we should, but we don't do it. It's the sin of omission. Please turn with me to James 4. James discusses the human frailty of knowing to do good, but then not doing it. James 4, and we'll begin in verse 13. James chapter 4 and verse 13. James writes, Go to now... You that say, tomorrow, today or tomorrow we will go to such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. 
For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. There is a time period. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live or, and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. And then verse 17. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Very plain. The sin of omission. So knowing to do good and then not doing it is a sin against God the Father. Please turn with me to Luke 10. Everyone knows the parable of the Good Samaritan. But there were two other people included in the parable who did not act in a proper way toward the wounded man. And it was sin. It was sin that they did. It's not what they did, didn't do. It's, what they, it's, what, it's not what they did. It's what they didn't do. Luke 10 and verse 30. Luke chapter 10 and verse 30. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. You know, brother, these two people did not act righteously. And these two people were a priest and a Levite. High people, highly regarded in Judea. They knew of God's law of mercy, but they did nothing to help a helpless and wounded man. Instead, they passed on the other side. They didn't even want to get near him. The parable doesn't say whether the victim was conscious or not. The parable is even worse if the victim was conscious and was moaning or crying out for help. You know, the priest and the Levite knew to do good, but they did not do anything. They did nothing. And they sinned against God as a result. You know, the second type of sin mentioned in verses 15 and 19 of Romans 7 is the sin of commission. It's the evil that we actually do when we disobey God's law. The sin of commission. Please turn with me to Galatians 5. You know, whereas Galatians 5.22 lists the fruit of God's Spirit, three verses earlier in Galatians 5.19, we read a very different list. A list of sins that we can commit that are active sins of commission against God the Father. Galatians 5 and verse 19 Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I've told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Brethren, these sins are active sins. They're not passive sins. It's not things that we don't do. It's things that we do do. These sins are sins that we commit with our actions, with our minds, with our motives, with our thoughts, with our attitudes, and with our words. Please turn with me to 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Where we will read about the act of sins that describe the society that we live in today at the end of this age. Like I said earlier, we live in a very evil age and it's becoming more and more evil with each passing day. 2 Timothy 3, we'll begin in verse 1. Paul writes, This also know that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, 
traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. You know, brethren, are there parts of Galatians 5 and 2 Timothy 3 that describe us? If so, are we overcoming these sins? Paul instructed that we should turn away from these traits. We should turn away from these characteristics. We should turn away from these sins. Please turn with me back to Romans 6. Paul also addresses the issue of cheap grace, which many in the worldly churches today believe in. You know, God forgives us so we can sin all we want. In fact, some churches teach that the more we sin, the more we show the glory of God because of His infinite grace and mercy. You know, brethren, that attitude goes against everything that God the Father wants in us. Yet do we ever find ourselves thinking, well, you know, I can sin this sin now and I can repent, and then the Father will forgive me. Do we play games with our Father? This is not a righteous attitude. And Paul discusses this, discusses this in Romans 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How that we that are dead, and, dead to sin live any longer therein. That's not the goal to keep sinning to show the magnitude of of God's mercy. So brethren, where are we in overcoming our sins? Have we overcome have we overcome some of our sins? Are we bearing good fruit in our progress against our struggles? Brethren, the third question to ask ourselves in determining what kind of fruit we are bearing is is God the Father increasing his spirit in us? Is God the Father increasing His Spirit in us? You know, brethren, the grand majority of us have been part of the faith for decades. Personally, for me, it's been 48 years. Do we have more of God's Spirit, more of the Father's Spirit in us now than we did decades ago? Is the Spirit increasing inside of us? During this time of introspection and the weeks leading up to Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we should honestly look at the condition of our spiritual lives to see where we are as vessels of our Heavenly Father's Spirit. Brethren, we must be putting sin out of our lives. Now is the time to concentrate on putting those sins out of our lives. But there is no void in this spiritual battle. If we put sin out of our spiritual lives, we must replace that void with more of our Heavenly Father's Spirit. We are either on an upward path or an upward path by decreasing in sin and increasing in the Father's Spirit, or we're on a downward path by increasing in sin and decreasing and our Father's Spirit. Brethren, the Feast of Unleavened Bread does not picture putting sin out of our lives. Just like it doesn't picture putting the physical leavening out of our homes. We do not deleaven our homes during the days of unleavened bread. Our homes are deleavened before the days of unleavened bread begin. And that's what we'll be doing in, a, in just a few weeks. We'll be cleaning our homes out in preparation of the Days of Unleavened Bread. Likewise, the Feast of Unleavened Bread pictures living a sinless life. The sin's already been removed. The leavening has been removed. It pictures living a sinless life with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, as Paul described in 1 Corinthians 5. So, brethren, are we putting sin out of our lives more and more? Do we ask God the Father for the power to do that? Do we ask our Heavenly Father 
to give us more of His Spirit. Please turn with me to Luke 11. Luke chapter 11. God the Father wants, us, wants to give us His Spirit. It's a great desire of His. And He wants to continue to increase His Spirit in us. Jesus addressed this concept in d discussing the love of a father. We read this in Luke chapter 11, and we'll begin in verse 9. Luke chapter 11 and verse 9. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is, who is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask for a fish, will, will he for a fish give him a serpent, serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? No father would do that. Then verse 13, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask Him? Just think on that for a minute. Brethren, do we ask God the Father for more of His Spirit? Is that in our daily prayers? When was the last time that we actually specifically asked Him for more of His Spirit? Jesus Christ is our perfect example for us to imitate and for us to follow. Jesus was the only begotten Son of God the Father when He walked this earth 2,000 years ago. Please turn with me to John 3. Jesus was very different from us in so, so many ways. And he left us such a wonderful, perfect example. And one of those ways that he was different was that he was always filled with his Father's Holy Spirit and had the Spirit without measure, without measure. John the Baptist proclaimed this to the multitudes in John 3 and verse 34. John chapter 3 and verse 34. John the Baptist said, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives not the Spirit by measure unto him. A better rendering of that is in the New Living Translation, which says, For he is sent by God. He speaks God's words, for God gives him the Spirit without limit. The Father gave Jesus Christ his Holy Spirit without limit measure without limit it was limitless so jesus lived a perfect sinless life because there was no room for sin in his spiritual life there was just no room there was no void it was completely taken up and occupied by the father's spirit and because jesus was filled always with the holy spirit to the point of overflowing, there was never any room for any evil thoughts, for any evil deeds, any attitudes that were evil, any evil speech, or any evil intentions. There just wasn't any room. In John 7 and verse 37, very famous verse that we all know, John 7 and verse 37. John chapter 7 and verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, which they who believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So brethren, the, the rivers of living water represent God's Holy Spirit, which flows through us and out of us. The Spirit influences us to do good 
and to counter the influences of this world, of Satan and his demons, and of our own human desires. Brethren, the spirit flowing through Jesus was like a powerful artesian well, gushing water up from the ground. There are no voids in that artesian well. Everything is filled with fresh, clean water that is forcefully coming from the ground. If you try to throw any contaminants into the artesian well, it's immediately rejected and removed. There's just no room for any contamination of the artesian wellspring because of the force of that water and the purity of its source. This is how Jesus never sinned. He was so filled with his Father's Spirit that there just wasn't any room for sin. The Spirit was gushing from him like water from a fire hose. But with us in our spiritual lives, the opposite can be true. Please turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5. You know, the Apostle Paul warns us with four simple words in Greek, which are also four simple words in English. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 19. These four simple words are, Quench not the Spirit. Quench not the Spirit. The Greek verb for quench in verse 19 is spenumi. S-B-E-N-N-U-M-I. Spenumi. It's Strong's Numbers 4570 which means to extinguish or to quench or to suppress. Brethren, if we are not exercising the Spirit, if we're not drawing closer and closer to the Father, if we're not allowing our Heavenly Father Father, to flow His Spirit through us, if we don't make our strong and deep relationship with our Heavenly Father the highest priority in our lives, we could be in the process of slowly but surely extinguishing and suppressing His Spirit within us. Please turn with me again to Ephesians 5. Conversely, God the Father wants us to be filled with His Spirit. Paul exhorted the Ephesian congregation concerning this in Ephesians 5. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16, Paul writes, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. We've read that earlier in the sermon. But continuing on, Wherefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Father is. This is kurios. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's a command. Be filled with the Spirit. But brethren, how much and how strong is God's Holy Spirit flowing through us? Is the Father's Spirit just a trickle? Is there any flow at all? During the next days and weeks, let's focus on increasing that flow and increasing the Spirit that the Father is putting in us. Brethren, are we in tune with, the, with God the Father? Are we continuing to study and to pray in order to, get, to draw closer to Him and understand more and more about Him? Please turn to 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, we've all been immensely blessed to have our minds and our understanding opened to the incredible and simple truth of God the Father's identity in the pages of the Bible. It's an incredible truth. And in the end, it's it's really simple. This understanding, though, did not come about by accident or by happenstance. God the Father has revealed incredible things about himself to us through his spirit. 
You know, in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9, Paul wrote, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that, who love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God the Father, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, meaning God the Father. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Brethren, we have such valuable, incredibly valuable and precious knowledge that's been opened to us. Brethren, are we growing in the Spirit? Are we continuing to yield to God the Father so that He can increase His Spirit in us and increase our understanding of Him? Please turn with me to Galatians 5. You know, Paul exhorts us to walk in the Spirit and to be led by the Spirit. And we read this in Galatians 5, beginning in verse 13. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. Paul writes, For brethren, you have been called into liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Are we doing that, brethren? Are we loving our fellow man? But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you not be consumed one, another, one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts after the Spirit, and the Spirit after the flesh, against the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. In verse 18, But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the Greek words for under the law are hupo-nomon. That's U-P-O-N-O-M-O-N. Hupo-nomon. Now, hupo is a Greek preposition which connotes many meanings dictated in part by the case that's used with it. Nomon is in the accusative case. Nomon means law. According to the Weiner's Greek grammar, hupo followed by the accusative case has the meaning of subject to the power of. So verse 18 could read, but if you are led by the Spirit... You are not subject to the power of the law. We are no longer subject to the power of the law because God the Father has given us favor and grace because we have His Spirit. And be, because we are being led by His Spirit. So, brethren, are we walking in the Spirit? Are we being led by the Spirit? Are we living our lives in a righteous way that God desires and in a way that God can continually give us more and more of His Spirit? Are we overcoming and putting away our sins? Are we allowing to have God's Holy Spirit push those sins out of our lives? Again, there's no void in our spiritual lives. And the Spirit can actually push those sins out of our lives. Brethren, are we praying? Are we studying? Are we fasting and drawing closer and closer to our Heavenly Father? Brethren, is God the Father increasing His Spirit in us? 
The fourth question to ask ourselves in determining what kind of fruit we are bearing is what type of fruit are we bearing? You know, brethren, God expects us to bear fruit. We just cannot do nothing. We just cannot do nothing. I know that that sentence is a double negative and is not good English grammar, but there is no better way of stating it. We just cannot do nothing. Please turn with me to Matthew 25. We all know the parable of the talents. But it's a very, very important concept that we learn here. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 14. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And one and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. And then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them another five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained another two. But he that received one and digged in the ground and hid his Lord's money, and after a long time the Lord of those servants comes and reckons with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well good, you good and well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter you into the joy of your Lord. He also that had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you have de you delivered unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant, for you have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter you into the joy of your Lord. These two people bore a lot of fruit. Then we come to verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you are a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not strawed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid my talent in the earth. There you have what is yours. His Lord answered and said unto him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. You ought to have at least put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him that had ten talents. For unto one, every one that has been give, has, shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that has not shall be taken away even that which he has. And cast you the unprofitable servant into outer darkness." There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, brethren, in the parable, the first man was given five talents, the second man was given two talents, and the first man gained five talents more and bore a lot of fruit. That's a lot of fruit. That's a 100% increase in fruit. The second man gained two talents more and also bore much fruit, another 100% increase. But the third man took the one talent and did nothing with it. That man bore absolutely no fruit. The third man was judged harshly because he had borne no fruit. The man had an excuse, but that excuse was not accepted. And he was cast into outer darkness. Brethren, are we making excuses for not growing for not bearing fruit. What excuses will we give to God the Father and to Jesus Christ when he asks for the return on his investment in us? Please turn with me to John 15. John chapter 15. On Passover night, Jesus discussed bearing fruit with his disciples. I would like to go through his discussion verse by verse and meaning by meaning. John chapter 15 and verse 1. 
Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit so shall you be my disciples. So let's look at what this parable actually says. Point A is God the Father is the husbandman. The New King James Version says the vine dresser. Point B, Jesus Christ is the vine. Point C, God the Father cuts off and puts away unfruitful branches. Point D, God the Father prunes the branches which are bearing fruit so that they will bear more fruit. Point E, we have to be part of the vine to bear fruit. It is not within us ourselves to bear fruit. It is only with God's Holy Spirit that we can bear fruit. Point F, without God's Holy Spirit, we wither and we die spiritually. And point G, God the Father is glorified when we bear fruit. Brethren, what kind of fruit should we be bearing? Please turn with me to Romans 12, where the Apostle Paul lists many fruits that we should be producing. Paul exhorted the members of the congregation in Rome to bear more and more and more fruit. It's a duty of a Christian. It's what, not only what the Father desires, it's what He demands and expects and requires. Romans 12 and verse 5. Romans chapter 12 and verse 5. Paul writes, So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching, or he that exhorts on exhortation. He that gives, let him do it with simplicity. He that rules with diligence. He that shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to, to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Eternal, says Yehovah. Therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let the Spirit push the evil out 
of our lives. So brethren, from these verses from Romans 12, let's ask ourselves these questions about bearing fruit. How much of the following fruit are we truly bearing? In verse 8, do we encourage others? Are we concerned about others? Do we truly pray for one another? Fellowshipping with brethren is a wonderful opportunity to encourage others who are dealing with many, many different problems and difficulties. Fellowshipping can be talking with one another at services, calling one another, writing to one another, texting to one another. In verse 8, are we generous? The second point, are we generous? Do we share with others the need? Or do we share with others in need, whether it be with our money, with our skill, with our time, with our compassion? The third point, verse in verse 8, do we show mercy to one another? Is it, it is so important that we do not allow bitterness and strive to enter into our relationships with one another in the church. If we are wronged by someone, are we quick to forgive? Are we quick to try to understand? Are, are we quick to reconcile and to resolve the wrong? Point D in verse 8, are we cheerful? Do we come to services with a smile? It is hard to comfort others who are struggling, and it's hard to encourage others if we walk around in a gloom and doom attitude. Point E in verse 10, are we selfless? Are we selfless? Do we honor others before ourselves? Do we let others have the bigger piece of pie? Are we interested more in helping others or more in who gets the credit? Point F in verse 12, do we rejoice? Do we reflect the joy that comes from the hope that we have from the knowledge of God's truth and the future, the incredible, wonderful future that awaits us all? Point G in verse 12, are we patient? Are we growing in patience even when we are wronged, even in crises, even when driving on the road in traffic? Are we patient with our children? Are we patient with our friends and our co-workers? Are we known by others for being patient? Point H in verse 12, are we praying? Are we spending time on our knees every day before our Heavenly Father in prayer? Are we praying effectively? Are we deepening our relationship with our Heavenly Father and with our Lord Jesus Christ? Do we pray for others? Do we take the, the prayer requests seriously? Do we pray for others who are struggling? Point I, in verse 13, are we helping with the needs of the brethren? Are we willing to help with the needs of others? Are we willing to help with the needs of the church and of the brethren? We brethren, for the most part, are scattered throughout the world, all over the country and throughout the world. Many brethren have specific needs. Are we ready, willing, and able to help those brethren in their needs? Point J in verse 13, are we hospitable? Do we invite others in our homes for dinner or just to, to get together? Do we find ways to, to fellowship with one another in the church, even though we may be scattered and may be far apart? Point K, verse 14, are we forgiving to others? Do we truly pray for our enemies and for, our, for people who mistreat us? and may even persecute us. Point L in verse 16, are we humble? Do we think too highly of ourselves? There's a big difference between being confident and being arrogant. Are we prideful or are we humble when we deal with others and when we deal 
with our Heavenly Father. And point M in verse 17, are we honest? Honesty is so missing in today's society. We simply live in a society that never, ever tells the truth, that always lies, that always stretches the truth beyond recognition, that always misleads for their own advantage. Are we known at work and are we known at school for being honest? It's a rare commodity in today's evil world. Brethren, it is obviously clear from Scripture that we must be bearing abundant fruit. Are we bearing these fruits that we just read about? So, brethren, are we redeeming the time that we have left on this earth to bear the maximum fruit that we can bear? Are we overcoming our sins and growing closer to God the Father to bear the maximum fruit that we can bear? Are we allowing God the Father to increase His Spirit in us each and every day so that we can bear the maximum fruit that we can bear? And are we bearing the abundant good fruit that God the Father wants us to bear? In closing, please turn with me to Colossians 1. Paul discusses that we should be fruitful in every good work. We read this in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, to desire that you, that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, increasing in the knowledge of God the Father. Brethren, we must bear fruit. We must bear abundant good fruit. It is not just an expectation that God the Father has of us. It is a requirement that He has set before us. But brethren, where are we in this process? Are we producing a bumper crop? Or is our spiritual fruit tree sickly and not bearing fruit at all? Brethren, it is never too late to start to bear fruit. God the Father and Jesus Christ will help us if we have the desire. But we must have to have the desire. We have to have that desire. God, our Heavenly Father will fill our weaknesses with His strengths. He will tend to us. He will nurture us. But we must want His help. We must have that desire, and we must move forward in our journey toward the kingdom. So, brethren, in the coming days and weeks before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, let us think and meditate on these subjects and issues and where we are in that spiritual journey. Brethren, I close with the question that is the title of my sermon. Are we bearing good abundant fruit.